From getting paid to lose weight, to getting paid to win MVP, even if you've got zero chance of winning it, NBA contracts have always had some clauses that are kinda strange or unrealistic. For the most part, NBA contracts are pretty standard. I mean, sometimes you get bonuses if you perform well, other times you get bonuses for leading your team to the playoffs. But for these contract clauses I'm gonna talk about, they're pretty funny or out of the ordinary. How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today, in this video, we're gonna take a look at 10 NBA players who've had some strange clauses in their contracts. Without further ado, let's begin. Also, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to subscribe. Apparently, over 60% of my viewers aren't. But hey, if you like the content, drop a sub or a like, and thank you so much for the support. Number 10, Glenn Davis. Now, it's not very rare to see players with weight clauses in their contracts, especially for guys who are on the heavier end. It gives them an incentive to lose weight so they can earn more money. For Glenn Davis, though, it was kind of extreme. In the 2009 offseason, the Celtics signed him to a two-year, $6 million contract. In that contract, there were several weight clauses. If Davis met that criteria, he would get paid an additional $500,000 per every threshold he met. While we don't know the exact weight thresholds he had to meet, we do know that he was well over 300 pounds during his early days in Boston. Fortunately, it seems to have worked. He continued to get into better shape. Later in his career, Davis lost a tremendous amount of weight. A few years later, with the Orlando Magic, Davis stated, 8th grade. Yeah, really, it's the lightest I've been since the 8th grade. This time, it's consistent. There have been times when I've lost a lot of weight, but I just gain it right back. But as far as consistently staying at this weight and staying down, it's been since the 8th grade when I was this thin. I guess the weight clauses were a good thing after all. Number 9, Tony Batie. Batie was a journeyman, playing for six different teams throughout his NBA career, and by 2009, his career was pretty much over. He was barely a bench warmer at this point, and he'd eventually retire a few years later. However, that didn't stop the New Jersey Nets from giving him some <laughs> extra bonus opportunities. The problem is, there was no way he qualified to meet any of them. The first clause was, if Batie were to play in at least 50 games per season and average 8 rebounds per game, he would get a $100,000 bonus. That seemed far out of reach for him, considering he only played 15 games that season, averaging just 1.5 rebounds per game. The second clause was, if he played in 50 plus games and his team made the playoffs, he'd get another 100k. That did not work out, because the Nets finished the season with a 12-70 and record. So, yeah, the absolute worst record in the entire league that season. The third clause was, he'd get another 100k if he averaged at least 5 free throws per game. Considering he never averaged even 2 free throws per game in any season of his career, that's also quite ridiculous. As expected, he didn't come close to meeting a single clause in his contract. Number 8, Rafer Austin. Skip to my Lou, a player many of you still recognize. Through the years, he developed his own unique style of play. At times, a very exciting point guard to watch. However, in 2004, after just having a season of averaging a modest 10 points, 4 assists, on 38% shooting, he signed a contract that included a clause that would pay him a huge bonus if he made the All-Star team. $325,000 to be exact. That's huge for him. It would have been like a 10% bonus to his salary. Although he did have some solid seasons in Houston and Toronto, there was no way he was going to make the All-Star team. At best, he was a decent starting point guard. This clause was far too unlikely to happen. Number 7, Luke Ridnour. Speaking of unlikely to happen, Luke Ridnour apparently had a clause in his contract in Seattle that would have granted him a $1.5 million bonus if he won Defensive Player of the Year. <laughs> Seriously? Luke Ridnour, Defensive Player of the Year? He's got a better chance of winning the lottery. Actually, he probably has a higher chance to win the lottery. I don't think anyone has ever talked about Ridnour being a capable defensive player. I mean, he was okay sometimes, but he wasn't anything special. I don't think I need to say this, but he never made any all-defensive team, as you probably already guessed. However, it was actually Ridnour himself who negotiated this clause for his contract. 
1.5 million is a massive bonus, about 25% of his yearly salary in Seattle. The Sonics knew he wouldn't win Defensive Player of the Year though, so they were fine with including this clause in the contract, knowing that he'd never get the 1.5 million bonus anyway. Hey, at least Ridnauer had faith in himself, at least he believed in himself. That's all that matters. Number 6, Nick Collison. Even more ridiculous than Ridnauer's clause, Nick Collison had a clause in his contract that would award him $100,000 if he won MVP. Yeah, you heard that right. Nick Collison, a bench player, for most of his NBA career, had this clause in his contract. To give him credit, we don't know when this clause was added to his deal. If it was early in his career, it kinda makes sense. Collison was a spectacular player in college and high school. He was first team All-American, the Big 12 Player of the Year, and the NABC Player of the Year. So he was well recognized, even as the 12th pick of the draft. Collison's agent negotiated this MVP clause into his contract in hopes of the small chance that he became a superstar. It didn't happen, but by the end of his career, he became a very well-respected player, and even had his jersey retired in OKC. Number 5, Adonal Foil. A guy who spent the majority of his time as a backup center on the Warriors, during a time period when the team was absolute trash. Foyle was nothing more than a role player, and yet he had two separate clauses in his contract which made no sense whatsoever. Similar to Nick Collison, Foyle had the MVP clause. If he won MVP, he would be awarded a $500,000 bonus. But even more whack, he had another clause for finals MVP. If he won the finals MVP, he'd be awarded another 500 grand. Besides the fact that he had no chance to win those, to win finals MVP suggests that the Warriors would make the finals. Except, in 9 of his 10 seasons in Golden State, the team didn't even make the playoffs. Number 4, Baron Davis. Despite his flaws, B. Dizzle was an exceptional player in his prime. Throughout his career, he's earned approximately 150 million. However, there were times when Davis played on some horrendous teams. One of which were the Clippers. Prior to the arrival of Blake Griffin and Chris Paul, they were one of the worst teams in the league. Davis signed with them in 2008, and it was a hefty contract. They were desperate to add any sort of talent on the roster. So desperate, in fact, they even offered Davis a $1 million bonus if he led the team to at least 30 wins in a season. I mean, that's just sad. 30 wins? That's all it takes? It just shows how low their expectations were. Unfortunately, Davis just barely missed the mark. In the 2009-10 season, the Clippers won 29 games, just barely missing it. But at that point, Davis wasn't even the best player on the team anymore. He fell off drastically. Number 3, Bill Walton. This is an old story, but a memorable one nonetheless. In the 1980s, Walton was going through a myriad of injuries, mainly foot problems. He did sign a sizable contract with the Clippers though, but the details of it were… well, it featured a wide range of different clauses. The first one was, if the Clippers did not make the playoffs, Walton had the option to terminate his contract and leave the team. So they never made the playoffs in any year he was there, but Walton still stayed, cause he liked living there. The second clause was, if the Clippers somehow reached the NBA Finals, Walton could have earned an additional $1 million bonus. If that never happened, they didn't even make the playoffs in his entire time there. Then, the next clause was the weirdest of all. Walton requested the Clippers give him tickets to see Bruce Springsteen. He requested 56 tickets to his concerts. Within the organization, it was known as the Bruce Springsteen Clause. It's unsure if the Clippers followed through with it, but it did piss them off. At that point of Walton's career, he was struggling to even stay on the floor due to injuries, so for him to request all of these incentives rubbed them the wrong way. Number 2, Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson had an incredible rookie season. Most fans know what he did. He helped the Lakers win the 1980 championship, with him starting at center in place of Kareem. However, after his rookie year, over the offseason, Johnson signed a 25-year contract, worth $25 million. At that time, it was the most lucrative deal any professional basketball player had ever signed. However, really? A 25-year deal? 
there's no player in NBA history who even played that many years. Johnson just wanted to secure the money, but at the same time, the NBA heavily grew its influence in the coming decades. Salaries started rising, so he probably could have gotten a lot more money down the road. To the Lakers' credit, they did give him additional money though. Every year he'd get bonuses. Even after getting diagnosed with HIV, the Lakers still signed him to a $20 million deal, just as a nice gesture to thank him for all his contributions and all the money he brought to the franchise. And finally, at number one, Michael Jordan. Ah, the good old love for the game clause. We heard MJ talk about this during his Hall of Fame speech. Basically, this clause allowed MJ to play basketball whenever and wherever he wanted to. Most players have certain restrictions in their contracts, like they aren't allowed to play basketball for the Olympic team, or they can't go to a foreign country to play, or they can't play in random exhibitions over the summer unless they get permission to. Teams do this because they don't want their players to be at risk for injury. But for MJ, he didn't have any of these restrictions. The love for the game clause let him play at any time he wished. Even if he was injured or he had pain in his body, but MJ could do whatever he wanted to. Also, during the short time Jordan retired to play baseball, the owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, owned the Chicago Bulls, he owned the Chicago White Sox, and he owned the Birmingham Barons, their minor league affiliate. So Jordan played for them, and he continued to get paid his NBA salary while playing baseball. That's pretty cool. Anyway, that's all folks, those were 10 times in NBA history where players had some weird clauses in their contracts. Let me know any other times you can think of. Which one in this video was your favorite? Thank you all so much for watching, I hope y'all enjoy the video, and of course as always, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Peace.